His robes for mine, oh wonderful exchange. Clothed in my sin, Christ suffered neath God's rage. Draped in his righteousness, I'm justified. In Christ I live, for in my place he died. His robes for mine, what cause have I for dread? God's daunting law, Christ mastered in my stead. Faultless I stand with righteous works not mine. Saved by my Lord's vicarious death and life. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost. Jesus forsaken, God estranged from God. But by such love my life is not my own. My praise, my all, shall be for Christ alone. His robes for mine, God's justice is appeased. Jesus is crushed, and thus the Father's pleased. Christ drank God's wrath on sin, then cried his dust. One. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost. Jesus forsaken, God estranged from God. But by such love, my life is not my own. My praise, my own, shall be. For Christ alone His robes for mine Such anguish none can know Christ God's beloved Condemned as though his foe He as though I Accursed and left alone I as though he Embraced and welcomed home, I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost. Jesus forsaken, God estranged from God, but by such love my life is not my own. It's not easy to be together like this, but it is good to be together like this, to support each other, to give comfort and peace. We need that. So I want to welcome you on the family's behalf and on behalf of the church here. We are glad that we can be together. I want to begin this morning with a reading from Psalm 1 I'm sure we're all familiar with, that 23rd Psalm, that Psalm of Comfort. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valleys, I fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. 
my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all of the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. I see everyone reaching for their phones now. I, I forget that. If you are, have a cell phone, I encourage you to silence that. It's usually my phone. Let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask you to be with us today. We know that you have promised that wherever two or more of your faithful ones are gathered, that you are present and here in this place today where there are so many who are celebrating this wonderful life, we know that you are here. But Lord, we need to feel you. We need to sense your presence. We need that comfort and peace that only you can give, the peace that passes understanding. Today, as we remember, as we reflect, as we think about the life of Mary, we ask that you would bring to our hearts the joyous times the inspiration, all of those blessed memories, and give us that comfort we need as we mourn. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
things, but if you have stories of your own, be ready to share those at the reception. So I want to encourage you to think about those. So invite Mark forward to share. I'm looking for Mark. There you are. <laughs> Come on up, sir. So I was Marion's nephew, which made her my Aunt Marion. <clears throat> and <clears throat> my earliest memory, my earliest memory is seeing Aunt Marion. When I was three years old, she and my uncle were married in 1951. They moved into an apartment in Newport Beach in Southern California, and my parents took me to see her. And my memory is standing in a hallway very dimly lighted, very dark paneling, a little wimpy light fixture at the top, and Aunt Marion standing there looking at me and smiling. And her smile more than made up for the wimpy light coming out of that little fixture in the ceiling. And her smile is something that I want to talk about because when she smiled, she smiled with her mouth, she smiled with her cheeks, she smiled with her eyes, she smiled with her eyebrows, I think her hair smiled. It was the whole picture. She smiled. And her smile conveyed love and comfort that I knew for 70 years. I knew her for 70 years and her smile was always the thing that was just so, so wonderful. She was like a second mother to me in many ways. I would spend summer vacation sometimes with her and my three cousins in La Habra, and then later <clears throat> would be doing the hard work of playing outside, and she'd call us in and give us lemonade. And she had these aluminum glasses, or aluminum tumblers, I guess, and they were in these pastel colors of like red or pink and, and blue, and they were, they, they were spun aluminum with this dimpled finish on the outside, and you put ice cold lemonade in those, and they get all frosty on the outside, and she'd make tuna sandwiches. And I learned from Aunt Marion that if you want to make a good tuna sandwich, it requires lots of pickle relish. And she would put the pickle relish in, and she'd make the tuna sandwiches and the lemonade, and it was just great. She liked to go to the beach. My parents didn't really. They weren't beach people. And so she would sometimes stop by and pick me up on her way to the beach. And I'd go to the beach with her and my cousins, which was great. One night I was staying at their house and there was a TV show back in the 50s called Steve Canyon. I think it probably ran for one season. It was a terrible show. <laughs> but it was about a fighter pilot and I wanted to watch, I was into watching Steve Canyon and so I asked Aunt Mary, can we watch Steve Canyon tonight? And she said, well you'll have to ask your uncle because it comes on at the same time as Gunsmoke. <laughs> so using her smile, she persuaded my uncle to let her precocious nephew watch Steve Canyon and sacrifice one episode of Gunsmoke. I now realize Gunsmoke was a far better show than Steve Canyon. <laughs> and of course it ran for a much longer time. And Marion suffered loss in her life. She lost a son, she lost a husband, she suffered other losses, but her smile always persevered. In later life, recent times, she shared with me many of the pains and frustrations that she shared, that she had suffered, but she always did it with her smile. And her smile, as I say, conveyed more love and more warmth than anything that I've ever experienced. I will miss her, but I always have her smile. I'll take that with me forever. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, we have a lot of good memories for sure. I know for myself, um, I just want to share a few of those. And you know, with our cell phones anymore, you know, as soon as it rings, you look down to see who's calling you. And I still have that tendency early in the morning or late at night, I think I'm going to see that MOM come up on my phone. Because those last few months, she, she called me pretty regularly. and. Uh, it's probably going to take me a while to get, to get used to that. 
Uh, you know, in my childhood, up until the time my, my father passed, he, he did get very sick and, and passed away, but um, my father always addressed my mom as Angel. Um, I, I, you know, I was a kid, so it probably didn't make much sense to me then, but it was, Angel, what's for dinner? Uh, Angel, can you help me with this? Or whatever it might be. And, and then when we would go out and maybe he introduced her to a stranger, it was, he didn't say this is my wife, he would say this is my bride. I think my father knew there was something awfully special about my mom and it may have taken me a little bit longer for that to sink in. You know, I forgot to mention in the obituary, but my mother was one heck of a cook and maybe even a better baker. Um, we all as family have memories of her crescent rolls. Um, that's something that we're all going to miss and it was a project because everything she did she made from scratch and I think those crescent rolls she had to make the day before and refrigerate and it was a big process but it wasn't enough just to have them at Christmas and Thanksgiving. Every time we got together we'd say, Mom, can you make those crescent rolls for us too? And when she made a chocolate cake, it wasn't enough just to make a two-layer cake. She would take those two layers and she would divide those again and put whipping cream in between. So when you got your wedge on your plate, there were three bands of whipping cream in between those chocolate layers of cake. I'm going to miss mom's chocolate cake for sure. Raisin cookies. It wasn't enough just to put a raisin in a cookie. She ran those raisins through a meat grinder, one of those old hand crank meat grinders and I swear I can still taste her raisin cookies and I hope I will for a long time. Good chewy raisin cookies. Yeah, I had my wife play Great Is Thy Faithfulness um, because even like Mark shared, um, my mom did have some pretty trying, some pretty challenging periods in her life. Um, Jim and I lost our brother back in 89 and and there was 81 days that he was in ICU. And that was tough, for, for I know for us, and it was probably tougher for my mom and my father. But when I hear that song, New Mercies I See Every Day, all my needs, everything I've needed, thy hands have provided. You know, I want to share with you too, when I was a kid, child, um, Mom used to come into our rooms when we would say our prayers at night. And uh, I was nine years old. And I remember because my brother and I shared a wall. We each had our own rooms. But I could hear him pray. And then Mom would come down into my room. And before I prayed, I said, well, Mom, how come Ken is saying the Lord's Prayer? And I'm saying, now I lay me down to sleep. And she says, well, honey, that's because your brother has accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And she says, is that something you think you might be ready to do? And I'm not sure I understood the whole concept, but then she pulled out that famous painting of Holman Hunt of Christ knocking on Hart's door. You know, the big arched door with vines growing over it. And she said, honey, do you notice anything different on the front of that door? And I didn't, and she says, well, there's no, there's no handle, there's no knob. You have to open that door from the inside. You have to invite Jesus into your heart. And maybe she knew from that age I was kind of a visual person, so that really helped me understand what she was trying to tell me. But from that night forward, she changed my life forever, sharing and introducing me to Jesus. You know, something that was dear to my mom was Galatians 5, and it's in your folder. It talks about the fruit of the Spirit. My mom was also quite a painter. And if you go down to the fellowship hall, we brought a few of her paintings so that you can see just how talented she was. She always said, boy, I sure wish I could figure out how to paint the fruit of the Spirit. And I said, boy, Mom, that, that's, that's a tall order. I, I'm not sure how we could do that. But I know that for my mom, understanding that fruit of the Spirit is probably the best way I can identify her today. And I grabbed her Bible before I came up here because she had written in her Bible regarding the fruit of the Spirit. Joy is love released. Peace is love at rest. 
Patience is love under trial. Kindness is love expressed. Goodness is love demonstrated. Faithfulness is love focused. Gentleness is love exposed. And self-control is love uncontrolled. I don't know where she got those notes, but if I could tell you of my mom's characteristics and her attitudes, I think the fruit of the Spirit defined my mom awfully well. Taking care of my mom and spending time with Floyd these last few months um, was quite a privilege. Um, running them to the doctor's appointments, running them to get their haircuts, taking them to get some groceries. Um, I even got to the point where mom wasn't able to go all the time, so she'd give me a shopping list. And I'll tell you, I knew the brand of her hairspray, her hair shampoo, her Clairol numbers, her L'Oreal numbers. I had it all down. So I knew exactly what mom needed, and I better come back with the right stuff, too, I'll tell you. Um, but that was, that was a privilege that I got. And, you know, I wasn't there for my mom's last breath but I wasn't far behind because they had called me and told me she wasn't responsive. And so I was already on the road and I got there and they let me go into the room. Mom was just sitting in her recliner like I shared in the obituary. She had a sock sitting on the arm of her chair, a bare foot, and she just had her chin, her chin on her chest. Just looked like she was sleeping like I've seen her so many times in her chair. Had that opportunity just to sit next to her and put my hand on her arm, which was still warm, and I just had a chance to just thank God for my mom and just all the years that he gave us together. And I'm so glad she went so peacefully. Um, she was at Grace of Caldwell. Some of you know the assisted living facility. And so after some time, the administrator came to me and she said, uh, Clay, we do something here called the Honor Walk. And she kind of gave me a quick little um, preview of what that was. And she says, when the funeral home comes and is ready to go, um, we like to play Amazing Grace through the speakers. And everybody here knows what that means, that somebody has passed. So sure enough, we got mom ready to go and down the hall. And so we proceeded down the hall and they were playing Amazing Grace through the speakers. And as I walked behind her, the residents would all come to their doors and they were standing in respect for my mom. Some would cross as we walked by and we got to the front of the facility and right in front of the administrative offices and nobody was working. Everybody just took a minute to stand up and pay respects to my mom. They could have pushed her out the back door or out the side thinking, oh, this is going to upset the residents. We can't do this this way. No, we took mom right down and right by the dining room. And there were still a lot of the residents that had just finished breakfast. And I'm sure the buzzword was, I think we heard Marion passed. So they were all waiting for us to come by the dining room. So everybody was there waiting out of respect and standing there, and we took mom right out the front doors of grace. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That was my mom. Thank you, mom, for introducing me to Jesus and living the life that was such a great example for me. Thank you.
Since all the rest of the family has kind of gotten choked up, I might as well join the party. <clears throat> I asked Clay, I said, is anybody reading the obituary? And he said, I don't think so. And so, just, just for your sake, it's, it's on the back of the program you came in with. Um, it would probably do you some good just to find out just a little bit more about mom. Um, and I thank Clay for putting that together. We kind of co-wrote that or gave ideas and things like that. And then there's, listen, there's, there's 20 plus years she was here in Idaho. So there's a number of you that have stories to tell and experiences to, uh, to live with. But uh, yeah, matter of fact, I was talking with John's wife in the back room there. She goes, was, was your mom always smiling? No. No, I told, I told her, I said, I think she was really melancholy. She was one of those kind of people, if she wasn't smiling, it was pretty stoic. She, she was a, she was a, she was disciplined in what she did. Once she got going on something, you know, this kind of face was what you saw. In the kitchen, Floyd, you saw it. You know, I know you saw it. She didn't want to be bothered. And Mark, I'm not going to correct you, but I'll tell you this story about pickle relish. She may have put that in tuna, but I doubt that. She was coming to the house. I think it was probably a 4th of July. We kind of tried to gather together as family on the 4th of July. And I told mom, I'm making your macaroni salad. I had it all done. She looked at it. She goes, what's that stuff in there? I said, that's pickle relish. She backed away. And as my wife and anybody there in the house could attest, I was in deep weeds. I mean, I had to get down on my hands and knees and almost plead for forgiveness. Yeah, yeah that gal. <laughs> you didn't use sweet little gherkins and chop them up finely? I said, Mom, it's the same stuff. A second time, she just backed up. Didn't even touch that salad. That was my mom, and you're right, Clay, great cook, and that that even that attests to that. And Mark, you're right. We went down to down to the beach, and poor old Jimmy dropped his tuna fish sandwich in the sand. Well, son, that's all you have. Have you had tuna fish sandwich with sand in it? her <laughs> and then if that wasn't good enough she would open up a bag of potato chips and the three of us would get our hands in there tear the bag apart and half the chips would get in the sand so if you didn't have a sandy sandwich you had sandy chips just a few early memories <clears throat> Do 
I know if she was here. She would want to make sure you know exactly where she's at and how she got there. Because, because it was nothing she did that puts her into the kingdom of God. Let me just share a couple things. <clears throat> when I left the house in Hood River, as good of a packer and as good as a memory I have, I forgot my giant print Bible. Well done, Jimmy. I can just hear her. <clears throat> so bear with me here. I'm using my wife's Bible, which is 12 font or less. I'm reading from Ecclesiastes, and there are some key words I want you to pay special attention to. It's good that we're gathered in the house of mourning today because this is where we're at. It brings into picture the finality of a life well lived and a life well lived with purpose. In our conversation the night before she died, that was a God sent divine appointment. We were planning on calling her Saturday. So much more convenient. I said, no, honey, we got a few, we got a few minutes Friday night. We can, we can call her. We can call her. Oh, it's too late. I said, wait a minute. 7.30? 8.30. It's 8.30 their time. So we called. One of the last things she shared with us she goes, no, you, you know, honey, I don't know why I've lived this long. I do. And God does too. So let me read this from Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Try to get that out of my eye again. There is an appointed time for everything. This is God's word. It's holy. It's true. And there is a time for every event under heaven. That's the time in which we live. Understand. A time to give birth, a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build up. A time to weep. And a time to laugh. And a time to mourn. And a time to dance. And a time to throw stones. And a time to gather those stones. And a time to embrace and a time to shun embracing. A time to search and a time to give up as lost. And a time to keep and time to throw away. A time to tear apart and a time to sew it together. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. What profit is there to the worker from that in which he toils? I have seen the task which God has given the sons of men with which to occupy themselves. The writer of Ecclesiastes, living under the sun, sums it all up. If we live our life for ourselves, it's vain. Vain, it profits you nothing. But I want to go back to that verse one. There is an appointed time. 
in Scripture in Hebrews 9.27, it says, there is an appointed time to die. After that comes the judgment. There is an appointed time to die. God knows every hair on our heads. It's the truth. It's the holy word of God. As we celebrate mom's life and continued life, let me take you to Ephesians 2. And just share a moment there because I think we have to reflect back <clears throat> where all of us began. Because of Adam's sin in the garden, God banished Adam and Eve out of the garden and into the world for their sin, for their disobedience. And because of that, everyone born of Adam and Eve was born in sin. There's no way to get back into that perfect garden unless God makes a way. And in Genesis 3, he shares us, shares with us what that way is. He promises a seed. And if you were to track that through Scripture, you'd understand that that's Jesus Christ. And he protected that seed. So jump quickly with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Because this is where all mankind finds himself. He's talking to believers here and he's reminding them where they were. He says, you were dead. My mom is dead. We had a viewing last night. You could touch her. You could rattle the casket. She wasn't going to say anything. She's done. She has finished the race. And she has run it well. But listen, as believers, that's where we were. But I'm assuming you're all believers. I can't do that. Because I'm not God. So there was a purpose for the song we sang early. Mom turned in her clothes for his robes. I would encourage you, if you haven't ever heard that song before, pull it up. It is the gospel in song. And if you pull up the artist, Ben Everson, and watch the videos, you'd even be amazed at his ability to communicate in song the written word of God. But there it is. The great exchange. His robes for mine. Clay's experience, the exchange. Mom would want you all to be aware of that exchange. It goes on, it says here, this is how dead we were. And you know dead people don't respond. Therefore, you can't do anything for your salvation. You can't. Since you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you were formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and the power of air and of the spirit, who is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of the flesh, including the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath even as the rest. Verse 4. 
but God. Genesis 3, the seed, but God. Being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive with Christ. How does that happen? Go to John 3, the story of Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. And he says, what must I do to be saved? Jesus says, you have to be born again. What? How can I be born again? the rebirthing. The Spirit comes down and bears witness. That's what the Spirit is. That, that is how the fruit of the Spirit gets demonstrated. It's God at work in those who trust Him. It goes on it says, together with Christ and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why? Why did he do that? So that in the ages to come he might show his surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you are saved through faith. Notice it says not as re not a result of works. In other words, there's nothing you can do. You can't pay your way in. You can't attend church and make your way in. You can't give to humanity billions of dollars. One way is by God and God alone. Christ and Christ alone. It is the gift of God not as a result of works, so that no man may boast, for we are his workmanship. Listen, as believers, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. Why? For good works, which God has prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. That was my mom. She was a living testimony of what Christ has done in her life. The love you have for one another is evident that Christ is, if you, if you can't love, you, you would have to question yourself in light of who Christ is. She would not want anyone to leave here not knowing about the Jesus she shared with Clay, the Jesus she has probably shared with many of you in here. And so I leave this young lady in front of you with that smile or what else is behind it all. For you to consider the word of God because it is the only thing that is eternal. Listen, it says you were dead in your trespasses. You and I come into this world. It's appointed to man once to die. Okay. After that comes judgment. You come in, you die once, or you come in, you're born once. Listen, you actually die twice. As you come in as a sinner, you die physically as evidence. And if you were to be with us at the gravesite, there's been many more that have gone before. And there's no respecter of time, no respecter of individuals. 
you die twice, physically and spiritually. Better to die once and be born twice. Physical birth as we enter this, and then the rebirth that Nicodemus was talking to Jesus about, you must be born again. I find it interesting, and I'll close with this. We think it's important that we know who God is, and it is important. Matter of fact, that's our whole mission as believers, to grow in Christ, to know him more. So, yeah, our desire would be to know Christ, but on judgment day, it's not about how much we know. It's whether or not he knows you. You're either going to enter into eternity. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Or Jesus himself is going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. He never knew you because you never had the circumcision in the heart, the change. And so, really on a glorious note, I want to leave you with that message. the eternal thing that you can grab on. I'm looking forward to a reunion with my mom and many of you supposing to be true believers. If you're not, you need to repent, change and entrust yourself to Jesus Christ. That would be my mom's departing words. As you know, she was a very kind person. She would want to care for you. So, thank you.
I don't know what more to say. It's a beautiful tribute that we've been hearing. Matthew 25, Jesus tells a story. There was a man, he said, who was planning to go on a long journey. He was going to go be away for quite some time, and so he called his servants together and gave them each a certain measure of his wealth for them to take care of. That's a familiar story, and we pay the most attention to that third servant, uh, the three. That servant took his master's wealth, and he buried it in a field, and then he dug it up when the master returned and, and gave it back to him. Now, this third servant gets the attention because he didn't do the right thing. He was supposed to do more than just hold on to what he'd been given to that resource, the, the talent that he'd been entrusted with. He was supposed to use it, but all he did was throw it in a hole. And the master was not pleased. He was called a wicked and lazy servant. Now, the obvious lesson here is that we don't want to be like that. We don't want to be that wicked and lazy servant. We don't want to be thrown into outer darkness uh, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's the way Jesus describes it. But what about the other two servants? Well, things end differently for them. They did what the master wanted them to do. They used what they were given for the master's good, and the master is pleased. To both of them, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been trustworthy with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Jim mentioned this, well done, Good and faithful one, enter into your master's joy. Now, as we've heard, the life that Marion lived proved that she was someone that understood this story. Now, there's a lot that could be said about Marion, and we've heard some of it. She was, like we all are, complex, an intricate tapestry of human experience. There may be more behind the smile, as Jim said, than what it looks like on the surface. But for me, the, what has blessed me was again and again to see her and Floyd here at the church, faithfully greeting people as they would come in the front door. Of the many gifts that Marion had, uh, the one that stands out for me the most is this effortless hospitality that she was always willing to share. Phenomenally graceful. You could not imagine a more kind and welcoming presence when you step through the front doors of the church. She and Floyd would be there. The first smiling faces that you would see, ready with a hug and a firm handshake. And if you were welcomed by Marion and Floyd, you were home. Hospitality isn't always easy. Offering hospitality sometimes means that we open ourselves to others and it can be awkward and uh, we're a little vulnerable. There's no guarantee that your welcome will be received or that people won't maybe take advantage of that offering. But Marion must have been faithful in a little because she had been entrusted with much. And now, for her hospitality and for countless other virtues that Marion possessed, she has been welcomed home. I have no doubt that Marion heard her master say, well done good and faithful servant. Enter into my joy. This story that Jesus tells, it's a wonderful description of faithfulness, of being trustworthy with what we've been given. Mary, and like those first two servants, uh, exhibited a rich faithfulness. What God had given her, she used it. She cared for and used for the benefit of others, which is exactly what her master wanted her to do. When we have a celebration of someone's life like this, I always want to take some time to acknowledge that the life that we're celebrating is a human life. And you, you know this as well as I do. It has all of that complexity and all of that awkwardness and even a measure of brokenness to it. We're subject to this. Marion was like all of us, a little bit human. 
For those of you who knew her better than I, the, the, the who grew up with her, who, who experienced so much, you know this. But while we can acknowledge it, we're not going to dwell there. That's not where we need to spend our time. And, and Marion had so much good in her that whatever human brokenness she suffered, it did seem to fade into the background, at least for me. She didn't dwell in the brokenness either. What I remember and what you will no doubt remember as well is that faithfulness. And that is what we need to hold on to. As Clay mentioned in that letter that Paul writes to the Galatians, we, we've heard that there are fruit that you can bear. The Spirit of God brings this uh, produce into our lives when we are tuned into that Spirit. The love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the generosity, the faithfulness, the gentleness, and self-control. And these things are given to the believer like the master in Jesus' story gives talents to his servants. But we have to do something with those things. We can't just receive them and hold on to them. We need to do something with them. They have to grow in us. They have to multiply and expand in us. This is what it means to be a good and faithful servant. This is what we are entrusted with. And as you've heard already, we have a choice. We can use what God has given us for God's glory and our neighbor's good, or we can take it and we can throw it in a hole and just do what benefits us personally. We don't have to think of the other's good. We don't have to make use of the things that we're given. We can throw it in a hole, but eventually, as you've heard, we will meet our master again, and we're going to have to give an account When we reflect on someone's life and when we celebrate the goodness that they brought with them, it's hard not to be inspired. I hope you are. I want to be more like Marion. More welcoming, more gracious, more hospitable. I want to bear fruit like she did in those countless hugs and the smiles and all the love that she could share in not pickle relish, but actually chopped up gherkins. I want to be more like that. The world needs a lot more people like Marion. There are far too few of them around. That's a shame. So maybe we should consider what we are doing with what God has given us. Do we share it like she did? Or do we throw it in a hole? But we have to be clear about something here. Marion didn't love so graciously simply because that is who she was. Like the servant in the story, that was something that was given to her. That abundance of fruit that she showed to all of us, it wasn't her fruit, it was the fruit of the Spirit living in her. The good that was in Mary and the, the, like the good that is in all of us who claim Jesus is Lord, it doesn't come from us. It comes from God. So we need to think a little bit about that other letter, the one that Jim referenced, the one that he wrote to the Ephesians. He says in that second chapter, again, you've heard the words that are printed in your bulletin, for by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. This is a gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. You, you, need to, you need to think about this when you think about the good works that Marion was so good at. She didn't do those things because she was good, inherently good, although that is how we knew her. She wasn't trying to make people like her more or trying to have something to boast about. She did that good because that is what she was created for, what she was transformed in order to do. Paul is so right here. This gift comes first. The grace comes first. The master gives to the servant first, and then the servant makes use of that gift. But there has to be a gift in the first place, and that's the place to start. Marion was who she was because of what God had given her. And she took those gifts and she used those gifts and she became really accomplished, quite 
quite good at the special things that God wanted her to do. But for all of that good, she was still saved by grace. The fruit that was produced in her, that was a response to that wonderful gift. And Marion's way of, of living, it pretty well hits the mark when it comes to what God wants from us. Do good. Be good. Use the gifts that God has given you. Don't throw them in a hole. <laughs> All of that's important. But again, it is just a response. What we are responding to, that is even more important. And we need to think about that initial relationship, that initial connection. We can't take care of the things that the master has given us if we're not servants in the first place. So we have to enter into that relationship. We have to enter into that, that communion. We have to accept this saving grace that Paul talks about. is something God wants to give us freely if we'll only receive it. Marion has been welcomed home, welcomed into her master's joy. She's been called good and faithful servant. And it all began for her the way that it begins for all of us, should we choose it. It begins with that gift of God's grace through the saving blood of Jesus. Like I mentioned before, the world needs a lot more Marians, a lot more people like her. We need more love. We need more graciousness. We need more hospitality. We need more fruit. And so we need more people who will accept what God offers to them. We need more people who will take that gift and make something of it. So I pray today that if you're on the edge of that, if you're thinking about that grace and wondering, yeah, maybe that's for me, that you'll do that. You'll take that step. You'll grab a hold of that gift today. God loves you. God loves you and wants to be able to welcome you home. You see, hospitality, that's God's thing. And I think those words are what we all hope to hear down in that deepest part of us. When our race is run, when we have completed it and we've crossed that line, we all want to hear, well done, good and faithful one. Enter into my joy. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this life that you gave to Marion, that she shared so abundantly with each of us. The graciousness, the hospitality, the love, the discipline, all of the things that she brought to this world are a gift that she received from you and she was faithful. She didn't hoard it. She didn't throw it in a hole. She allowed that fruit to grow and expand and produce in her own life so that we were all blessed by it. But it all came from you, Lord, and we praise you for it. Again, we ask that you would bless each one here with your comfort and your peace as we come to terms with a life without the physical presence of Marion. Lord, help us to grab a hold of that gift, that grace, whether... We did it a long time ago and we still need that grace or whether it's the first thing, uh, the first step in a journey with you, we pray that you would give each one here a full measure. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing Amazing Grace. The family chose this song. I believe the words are up, going to be up here on the note, not on the screen. Uh, it's in the blue hymnal, page 143. We'll just do the first and last verse. <laughs>
Thank you. You may be seated. We are going to dismiss the family first. They are going to form a receiving line in the foyer. You'll have an opportunity to greet them and to offer your condolences uh, at that time. But that isn't where this ends. You are also all invited to come down to the fellowship hall, just down this hallway to the end for a, a fellowship meal, a time to break bread together. I have to say, these are important things to do when we are in this place formally taking our leave, but I have witnessed more healing happening around a table than I have here. It is wonderful to share together, to express those memories, and to really have that opportunity to give each other a little hug. And so we want to invite you all down to the fellowship hall for that meal following. Um, I'm sure I'm missing something that I needed to say, but I think that may be just about it. What a good life we are celebrating. If you'll bow with me, I'll ask a closing blessing. Lord, we ask that you would bless each one here with your peace and your comfort as they mourn and as they celebrate, as they call to mind all the good memories. We thank you for this life. We thank you. We thank you for Marion and the gift that she was to so many people. We'll carry a little bit of with her with us, and we thank you for that gift as well. Lord, be with us as we depart. We ask a blessing on the meal that we will share. May it touch not only our bodies, but our spirits to be together around a table. We pray all of these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.